Coming together from across the United States. The real issues you don't hear about elsewhere. Focusing on what matters to you and your neighbors. Welcome to Resist Bot Live. Hey, y'all. It's May 1st, 2022. I'm your moderator, Melanie Dion, and this is Resist Spot Live. Welcome to our discussion. We are here this Sunday and every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. If you'd like to join us, you can subscribe at rs.bot slash video. If you want to listen from a podcast, that's rs.bot slash pod. And you can join the conversation by using the hashtag live bothers. Today, oop, I'm already sounding like Wheezy Jefferson. <laughs> Today, we are talking about how even when we live in democratic nations, there's still always a space where we have to be vigilant about authoritarianism. Recently, Russia invading the Ukraine has been a huge story. But it's not the only story of its kind, and it's not the only, um, Ukraine is not the only nation under that type of threat. We've been, for, for the past few years, seeing China taking more aggressive stances without as much notice because there's not as much overt or evident physical violence. So we want to talk a bit about what that looks like and how that impacts not only China or Taiwan, but how that impacts us in the U.S. and how authoritarianism can still find its space here. So I want to start bringing up our panelists. First, Susan Stutz, blogger extraordinaire, will be joining us. Hi, Mel. Hey, Susan. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to this conversation. You know, I mean, I think so many of us, and I know that I was guilty of this, at least at some point, and maybe to some extent still, you know, thinking that what happens over there on the other side of the world doesn't really impact me. You know, it really doesn't, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life. And that isn't necessarily true. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because China plays a huge part in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. And I so think I think it's good to highlight this. Absolutely. I think that's a function of how we're educated as Americans. We're, we're educated with this kind of center of the universe yes. mentality that happens a lot. So when it's something that's not impacting us negatively immediately, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know the inner workings of how China impacts things like trade. Right. You know, so it's, it's a really... It's very interesting. And even how how there are certain um, sentiments that it, it it guides here due to whether it's misinformation or, you know, being the bigger story. You know, right. China is a much larger nation than, you know, than, say, for example, Taiwan, much larger than Hong Kong. So we have to look at, you know, the whys and, and dig a little deeper. And yes. thankfully, we have someone who um, has experience, you know, we always like to talk to people who know the stories, whether it's from doing the work or from lived experience. And among us, we have someone with lived experience, and that is our next guest and fave, Christine Liu. Hey, hey there, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's interesting because usually I am the guest, regular guest, and this is a new role for me where mm -hmm. we are going to get to talk about a lot of things that I, you know, focus on and care about. And um, I'm going to do it speaking to what Susan mentioned, because we've all been in that situation where we feel like we don't know a lot because we are so centered on the U.S., but I'm going to try to make this international conversation, very domestic, right? And so I look forward to to sharing that with, with, the, with the listeners. Thanks so much. I always joke about you being the international woman of mystery. <laughs> and um, I want to go back to sort of the beginning of, of our time together, even 
in one of our earlier episodes, our American story, where we talked a little bit, or our American stories, where we talked a little bit about you and your family coming to the U.S. Right. Um, so I was born in Taiwan, um, and I came here, actually, uh, to the U.S. when I was just two years old. So, um, you know, my parents immigrated in the 70s, and I often talk about that because uh there are a couple of narratives as, over the years that have really um, led me to kind of explore this, what it means to be an immigrant or, or be more conscious of how this group of Americans are viewed, and at least from my lens and experience. And one of the notions that I have uh, sought to dispel over the recent years is um, you know, that there's this different kind of immigrant. There is legal versus illegal, like we talked about in the last show. And what really has bothered me about that is in looking into how I arrived here, right, going way back to the 70s, you realize um, it wasn't too long ago that people that looked like me were completely legally banned from even entering the country, the Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, so growing up, we didn't really, you know, um, I wasn't really conscious of that. That's not what we kind of, you know, as you know, our history books are not very, um, you know, uh, informative when it comes to certain parts of our history. And that was one of them. So, so once I realized that it was really because of the civil rights movement, that there was a wave of immigrants from Asia that was allowed to come in the seventies, my parents and I being beneficiaries of that, that really kind of felt less othered. Does that make sense? Like we're always thought that, you know, the communities that we, um, we, we always feel like, okay, we're new. So keep your head down. Don't say anything. Kind of uh, build that American dream in your, um, you know, respective, I guess, bubbles, if you will. So from that tidbit uh, from the beginning, can you talk a little bit sort of giving us not the quick and dirty but sort of the the brief history of of how things got there and what motivated your family to leave yes so um i will preface that by saying um i am taiwanese american um but you know over the years we also call ourselves Asian American, depending on the situation. And uh, so it's important for this conversation today. I am speaking from the perspective of a Taiwanese American who is also Asian American. And I really do appreciate the space because actually we're heading into AAPI Heritage Month. And so what inspires me is um, having shared my, my family's story of coming over here, what I often am very aware of is first generation immigrants like my parents are just so focused on trying to assimilate, getting their bearings, um, supporting the family with very limited knowledge of American culture, of the language and doing all that while trying to also raise kids and hopefully, you know, this dream, this American dream they have of sending them to college. So that was my parents' generation. And, you know, as I've gotten older and I'm a mom myself of a 16 year old son who is college bound, gosh, the time flies in just two years. <clears throat> I am now in the situation where I feel a responsibility, um, you know, what kind of torch are my parents passing to me? I am their daughter and Growing up, I was a very Americanized daughter. A lot of people from immigrant households can relate because we grow up bicultural. <clears throat> and, you know, it's interesting that the things that my mother used to criticize me about when I was younger, because we had this um, constant, uh, you know, um, tension, I would say, right? A very natural tension between her world and how she was brought up mm -hmm. and mine, which is very American. And that tension would always result in just the oversimplification of a mother to a daughter saying, you're too Americanized, right? So I think a lot of us either can relate to that or have friends who come from immigrant um, backgrounds that can relate to that. 
So as now I am in a position in life and, you know, an, an understanding and awareness, yeah, I am going to be too Americanized. And what that means to me is I feel a responsibility for my son's generation to be vocal. My parents worked really hard um, to give me this life in, in a country that offered me more opportunity than the country we left. And so <clears throat> that first and foremost is the context of where I share all this. Another thing I wanna make sure that we understand as we're having this dialogue today, this is by no means, um, you know, when we say and mention China, we are not talking about Chinese people. We are talking about the actions of the Chinese government. And one of the beauties of growing up in a country that allows for the freedom of self-expression is we are just very privileged in America to be able to differentiate between American people and our, our American government. And when the government is not serving the interests of the people, we are you know, we have the freedom to be vocal about that without losing our love of American culture, American people, right? And so in that same context, when I talk about China, I'm speaking about my criticism of the Chinese government. And it's actually a direct result of my last 20 years experience uh, as somebody who is Taiwanese American, but that actually lived and worked in China for many years and has continued to have these 20 year relationships with Chinese friends. So the insights I share aren't from the bias of someone who is only American or the bias of someone who comes from a Taiwanese background, but it's also the lived experience of somebody who has actual Chinese friends who cannot in many cases express the things that I feel I can be a voice to them for. And so I just wanted to start there. Yeah. I appreciate that because I think that's something when we take on these conversations, we're almost exclusively taking on the systems and the culture bearers of those systems. Like who, who are the voices that are perpetuating these systems and not so much an individual. It's even when we are dealing with individuals, it's more often than not the individual's actions perpetuating these systems. And I think that's a very important thing when we have any of these conversations. I, I mean, as a, as a person who is, a, you know, a Black woman in America, I have to have these conversations all the time when I'm dealing with matters of white privilege, when we're talking about privileges or oppression or authoritarianism, we have to look at how we're addressing this actual system. Because when people personalize it, it goes into a, a different area where we it, it stalls conversation. Mm -hmm. It stalls conversation. It stalls discourse entirely. So I appreciate that and understand exactly why. Um, why you pointed that out. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what being a Taiwanese American and working in China, spending an, an extensive period of time working in China has meant for you. And also what that's looked like for you as someone who has become vocal um, in in your stances about what's going on? Absolutely. Um, so for me, my first, and this is where I pull out my, my both my age card and my street cred, <laughs> right? <laughs> when it comes to this, um, my family who is from Taiwan and, you know, my grandmother has a company that she started, my late grandmother, that actually entered China and expanded from Taiwan to China in um, 1991. So we're talking shortly after Tiananmen Square at a period of time in the world when a lot of people and con uh, countries and um, um, companies pulled out their resources at a time when China was still trying to develop into the economic power that it is today and lift 
you know, people out of poverty there. The two groups that invested early and that went back in were groups uh, of investors and business people from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And so my family's background is a direct result of that. And I myself was a college student in the 90s, spent every summer vacation as a result in Shanghai and graduated with um, you know, international relations degree because my experience in you know, China during those summers from that specific period of time in China's growth really inspired me to um, you know, carve out a career for myself. And so after graduation, I packed up and I moved there. And from 1999 to 2004, I lived and worked in Shanghai. So that's important to note because I never, now, you know, fast forward, I never criticize things that I don't feel. I have either experienced myself from a firsthand perspective or um, have friends and deep relationships that have been forged from the last 20 years to be able to hopefully speak on their behalf. And I say that because um, we're dealing with um, we're dealing with a government that unfairly is able to exert its economic um, strength now, right? As a result of being um, given the ability to grow and integrate with the international world, and many of us, those you know, me included, were part of that. So I come to you now as somebody who's looking back and saying, wow, and I'll be just really honest, part of me just looking at the state of where uh, the Chinese government is heading today in terms of human rights and in terms of its reach and its um, still lack of freedoms for many of its own citizens, I look back and I say, yeah, I was that naive American foreigner who actually believed in that period of time that I could be part of a generation who went and embraced and built cultural bridges with the purpose and the goal of hopefully looking towards the next generation. And I used to say this, many of my friends who know me say this, can you imagine what the next 10 years are gonna look like if the world embraces the next generation of Chinese students who have learned English, who are studying abroad, who are trying to learn different cultures, like whatever we see now, and this was my ability to be able to almost naively um, dismiss what was going on and the criticism at the time of China, because I looked at it as, okay, let's pick our battles. I want the long-term goal of a country that integrates with the world and that has a generation of Chinese who are our friends, who are our business partners, who are actually part of establishing peace in the world, you know, and this was my, this was, this was me. <laughs> so I'll just stop there and see if you or Susan have any questions. This was, yes. this is a, this is a tough one for me because I, I just, um, how much do you think that that perspective changes though? Um, I, let me backtrack. I imagine that China had a different, stance internationally when it didn't have the military might that it has now. So it, it may have taken, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, what or basically I'm asking you, was the perspective different um, when China didn't have the military um, prowess that it has um, such that they could not they had to lean more on what the rest of the international community said and felt as opposed to currently where they are very close to us in their military and whatnot. So is there a difference there if that makes sense to you? Yeah, no, absolutely. If you spoke to me just even five years ago, like this, this awareness has actually come about just in the recent years. And it's a direct result, I'll just get right to the heart of it, of the fact that you have a president in China right now, who five years ago, a little bit over five years ago, decided to take it upon himself to actually shake things up domestically. And he changed the constitution 
So imagine if someone here, which they are trying, right, was mm -hmm. able to disrupt the normal uh, process. There is supposed to be a peaceful handover every 10 years of a new president. And, you know, the policies that were set from before carry on. And that that contributes to stability in the world because it's predictable. So, you know, a little over five years ago, actually a little longer now, you had President Xi Jinping change the constitution to allow for himself to indefinitely not only seek a third term, but remain in power indefinitely. So you can imagine then for us, those of us who are very knowledgeable and experienced with what our version of China was, and I talk about different versions, that was an alarm bell. And the other part is, then you start to put the pieces together from that level of awareness. And you see what happened in Hong Kong in 2019. Hong Kong, a city that used to be many people who traveled overseas used to always talk about Hong Kong as one of their favorite international cities. And even though it was handed over back to China because there was that treaty with the British and you know it was a colony before, but even when it was handed over, it was supposed to be uh, what they call one one country, two systems. We're going to leave Hong Kong alone. We're not going to mess with it. You know, all the freedom of speech and the rights and that they have, nothing's going to change. Well, look at what happened in 2019. And those who aren't aware just need to Google Hong Kong 2019. So when you have those data points coming from my perspective, you're just like, oh, wow, this is not, this is not what I signed up for, right? And then it gets really personal as somebody who is not only Taiwanese, my family has been in Taiwan for 25 generations. My ancestors recorded history. And I say recorded history. We, as uh, my family lineage, have experienced colonization from the Spanish, the Dutch, the Japanese. My grandparents grew up in colonized Taiwan, speaking only Japanese, didn't even learn how to speak Mandarin until they were adults. And then this recent, um, you know, the recent reason why there is such tension with this China-US-Taiwan triangle is because, you know, I was born in 1976 into a martial law Taiwan. A lot of people don't know that because we look at Taiwan today and we don't know because we don't talk about it, that it's actually a young democracy of only 30 years, mm -hmm. right? And without going really deep, I just want to just be able to say, without understanding that, it's not the fault of those in America because I didn't even learn any of this until I was older and sought that information out while I was in college, right? But thankfully it's available there for for those of us who want to research. But the reason why we have not heard about much about Taiwan is by design is because, um, you know, um, China's economic influence on the world also allows it the ability to silence its criticism of itself by people who are smaller, <laughs> like, like an island of 23 million people who just want to govern themselves, right? I have a question about that a little bit because mm -hmm. when we talk about students um, coming to learn here, there's mm -hmm. a there's a certain spirit, there's a certain reason people want to want to study in America, um, including you know, including studying in a democracy among people who more or less have always known freedom of speech. But that does not mean the same when you come from an authoritarian nation, especially when your citizenship is still there. Can you talk a bit about what post-graduation can look like for students who study here? Oh, yes. Um, on an extreme case, it could look like jail time because you were a University of Minnesota student from China who tweeted a satirical uh, tweet or comic about your president, President Xi Jinping, and then come to find out 
you were flagged and when you returned to China, you were jailed for six months. I mean, I'm just going to get straight to it. This is the reason why a lot of people don't know that. And, and again, <clears throat> let's take it back to a, a, a relatable place. I'm the mom of a 16 year old son who is Taiwanese American. I would love for him to be able to be a regular college kid in a couple years. And that means experiencing the freedom that our country affords him and not having him be worried or afraid that he may get inadvertently get an international student from China in trouble just based on their friendship because you've got a government that actually closely monitors and keeps track of their you know Chinese students overseas. Um, I'm just going to stop there and let you like really sink in about how we have no idea as Americans, you know, that you would think it would be that simple that international students, when they travel and come and live and work here, part of the joy of being a, a, a foreign student is to immerse yourself in a culture. And our culture has yeah. so many options, right? That's right. not the case. And I mean, you think about it. It was what a 20 year old kid, right? Like think about ourselves at 20 and, and what it was like coming to our own as adults, experiencing a life sometimes for the first time or, or early in the early stages outside of what our parents exposed us to and kind of, you know, so, and, and expressing those things and, and not really being, not only not really being able to do that, but also having to have a concern about what your friends might say. That's or imagine. Very, yeah, that's a very weighty Absolutely. obligation for, for, for college life in general. Imagine you're 18 and you grew up in a country that has censored information all your life and you arrive at a country that allows freedom of access, <clears throat> excuse me, to whatever information you want to access. It's a shock. And the, the one of the functions of these authoritarian governments, there was just recently in March, um, a, a Brookings report that talked about how China and Russia were sort of piggybacking on certain disinformation because while they were not buddies, they definitely had a certain vested interest in certain stories being, um, in certain misleading stories being promoted. So what is that like? I mean, there are all there are all sorts of ways authoritarianism can function, whether it's um, through politics, through you know, family dynamics, through religion. And and there's just this common thread of what happens to you when information has been controlled and now you have access to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm still sort of a, a little flooded, you know, flooded by that thought myself, but what is that, what does that do for the, for the loved ones of, of students who go away? Am I going like too deep in the weeds with this question? No, but you're what not. Is that, I mean... like, what is the concern like? When, because we have this idea of people being excited to come to America, but what is that actually like for a family whose, you know, child is going to America and they know what can happen? What is that experience like? If you can give us a little glimpse of that. Yeah, I can give you actually a, a specific example. I because of my history in cross-border U.S.-China relations by way of business, I have had the opportunity to mentor young Chinese students and recent grads over the last decade. And this is why I speak out because they are unable to. There is a culture of self-censorship that goes on. So let me give you a specific example. When we were all in lockdown, because this is very recent, when we were all in lockdown, and Clubhouse became a very fun place for all of us to <laughs> just express ourselves. Well, there was a 19-year-old uh, Chinese student who was living and working here in, living here in Southern California. 
he shared just a, 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 the census report that had recently come out from China. Public information, by the way, that the Chinese government released to everyone. And he decided to do innocently a clubhouse room just talking about what he thinks this report means, right? And apparently it got a little bit too opinionated for the listeners, some of the listeners in the room. Well, imagine to your surprise being quote unquote doxxed, being exposed, um, having some students or anonymous people who had heard about your clubhouse room, finding out your Instagram, personal Instagram account. Um, and the worst part about it is a couple weeks later, getting a call from your parents in China because they had been visited by the local police there as a result of them hearing that your son has been causing trouble and spreading, you know, anti-Chinese information, you know, in, in circles in America. I mean, let me just let you sit on that. This is an actual kid that I had face-to-face -face coffee with that for obvious reasons, I will not say who he is, but this is happening. And so a lot of times I feel in the case of the, the student in Minnesota that was jailed for six months, or even in the case of this person who innocently wanted to open a room on Clubhouse and just talk about his country. Um, I think those are examples that are being set and what it does, ha what happens, it, it sets an example for other Chinese students. I better not say anything during my four years in this country that allows for freedom of speech and protest and access to information. That does not apply to me. So, you know, as somebody who sits back and, and has a soon to be college age kid, I, I have feelings about that. That as we is, all should. That <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, Susan, just sit yeah, on it because I mean, it is. I'm thinking, not about that, we think about. and I'm thinking about you know how in my mind those people that are here in America, the the citizens that live here, the people that come from other countries, whether it's to go to college or pursue careers, and you envision that they have the same experience, at least in you know the basics, that we all have this same shared experience of being able to speak out on the things that we want to speak out on, because, you know, this is America and the First Amendment is, you know, it's huge. It's huge. And so, and that that First Amendment applies to everybody. So to hear that, that a, a young person who just wants to have an open conversation and that the government goes to their parents that is mind blowing. Like I couldn't even imagine what that must feel like. I mean, how horrifying that must be. And imagine the weight, right? Now you absolutely. are responsible as a young student in America, you're responsible for the safety or the reputation of your parents back in China. And we think about that. Um, it, as, as foreign as it sounds on its face, as Americans, we think about how that is something that, you know, author, authoritarianism, even if it's wearing different clothes, it still has the same thing on underneath. Mm -hmm. And so we, when we, if we look at policing in this country and what it's like, say, speaking out against the police, why there are cops who are terrified to to you know speak honestly on what it's like to be i mean even if we just look at it in that very small container it's all the same thing the the even when the the reasons are different even when it's you know if it's rooted in something political as opposed to something religious i mean we can think of religions that use those same tactics, mm -hmm. where if you speak against the church, the first thing they do to get you back in line is go to your family. Right. And so it's amazing how 
this is something there's that consistent thread, even when there are different reasons, there's always, it's going to hit the same points every time. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked a lot about the, the how and the what, but we also like to talk about the what now. And, and so, you know, when we get into what a call to action actually looks like, we have another opportunity where we have our petition writer on with us um, for this week's petition. And that is Christine. Full disclosure, it was my first time, so I'm kind of excited <laughs> that, it, that it actually worked. Um, so I do appreciate the, the ability to, to, to go through this. Um, would you like me to read it, Mel? Is that sure thing? Yes, please. Okay, so my very first petition, um, which you can text P D S T A H to five zero four zero nine, um, is titled "Protect International Students in the U.S. from Authoritarian Governments." Pretty simple and straightforward. I am writing about my concern for international students studying in America and ensuring that college campuses are free of intimidation from authoritarian governments. Specifically, I would like college campuses in the U.S. to protect the rights of Uyghur, Tibetan, Taiwanese, and Hong Kong students when they are documented cases of Chinese government influence and intimidation of these groups on campus. I would also like universities to ensure that Chinese students studying in the U.S. feel safe to learn and experience the full rights of a democratic society that this country offers them during their time here. Suggestions include, but are not limited to, a review and update of university anti-harassment policies, provide international students with resources and access to anti-censorship communication tools, so perhaps they can express themselves freely, create a curriculum opportunities and scheduled talks that inspire safe learning environments for international students. And so that's it. I also claim the keyword because that is an awesome thing that ResistBot allows for those of us who really want to become active and be a monthly donor. So if you text Taiwan now to 50409, it will take you to my page that has this petition and um, going forward, any other petitions that I support. Thank you. Yes. And so make sure you follow, make sure you follow. That is that is awesome. And I appreciate how direct your call to action is. I think sometimes when we we can talk about it and things seem so insurmountable, but um I mean the call to action actually, Mel, is the awareness. Yeah. Like I mentioned. And when we want to talk about power structures that we all know, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's a reason for that phrase. Let's look at the universities that that are benefiting from donors and full tuition payments of international Chinese students and the Chinese government programs that support them, which is creating an environment that perhaps is being the reason or part of the reason why groups such as this I've, I've spoken to feel unsafe to speak out or be themselves. Let's follow the money. That was another episode. It applies here too. Always. It's mm -hmm. it's again, we when we start dealing with with these oppressive structures, it's always we always have some of the same themes, even mm -hmm. if when it's not right on the nose, you're like, oh yeah, it's this again. I um wanna thank you so much, so much. Cause I know this was a heavy lift and it's it's a lot of information when we start digging into oppression, especially when we um, when we live, I'll say under the guise of freedom, because I have a, a very good, a, a very good friend who says, and I've quoted before, the 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 structures are as strong or as trash as the people who uphold and defend them. Mm -hmm. So if we're dealing with people who are on the side of right, on the side of 
of what's um, equitable, then we get that. When you don't, you don't. So it's, it's, I appreciate this conversation and look forward to more conversations like it because this is the world we live in. So this won't be the only time we talk about something similar. So before I lead us out, I want to give you both the opportunity to talk about any, give your, your parting thoughts and let the folks know where they can find you first, Susan. Um, my parting thoughts are, you know, that this is a, this is a topic I definitely want to learn more about, um, you know, and, and to have a better understanding of how, what happens on the other side of the world absolutely does impact me. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I did find, um, a very good article written by Abe Shinzo, uh, for, uh, Project Syndicate. And, um, it's a very good beginner primer to understanding the conflict between Taiwan and um, China. So, and that helped me a lot. So it's, again, it's Project Syndicate and it's an article It's dated April 12th of this year by Abe Shinzo. So I encourage everybody to, to go out and look at that because it really broke it down in, in terms that I could understand um, and took this huge topic and made it you know digestible for me so that I could better understand what was happening. Um, where I'm going to be, again, I said it last week, you know, we're coming up on elections and just getting out there, getting people to register, make sure that they're registered, they haven't fallen off the rolls, make sure your signature matches, make sure your signature matches so your ballot doesn't get rejected. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Thanks so much. And remember, if you want to make sure that you're registered, text VOTE to 50409 and we can check it out for you. So thanks, Susan. And last but not least, Christine. Yes, thank you, Mel. Um, my parting thought would just be of gratitude for having the space to talk about an issue that, you know, like I said, universities don't like to talk about, the media doesn't really like to mention, um, and definitely, authoritarian governments are hoping you, you don't mention. So to be able to have a space to be able to raise awareness um, is very important. And especially, like I said, going into API Heritage Month, it's so important um, for us as a group. Uh, Asian Americans have always been stereotyped as not being very vocal right? And especially not vocal about being a stand for other people. And so I just wanted to set an example of many others that are out there in our generation who are trying to um, be more vocal and um, grateful for platforms like this that give us the ability to do so. Thanks so much, Christine. And thank you. If you want to follow Susan, you can follow her on Twitter at twinthing2, T-O-O. You can follow Christine at Christine Lou. And you can follow me at the Gates of Mel. The O is a zero because I like to make it complicated. If you want to learn more about ResistBot, if you'd like to volunteer, if you'd like to donate, resist.com. Bot. You can also email us at volunteer at resist.bot if you'd like to donate. Another way you can, or, or if you'd like to volunteer, sorry. Another way you can help is by donating, and we have some new monthly donors. First, we have Jean Marie from Soap Lake, Washington, Tax Gas Companies. I know that's right. And we also have Amanda from Los Angeles, California, Protect trans youth always thank you thank you jean marie and thank you amanda because you make what we do possible resist spot is run by volunteers we have a small but mighty team and your donations help us do what we can do including this show so thank you very much you can follow us on youtube on our youtube channel uh rs.bot slash video you can like us on facebook at resist spot you can follow us on Twitter at ResistBot. You can subscribe to our podcast at rs.bot slash pod. I want to thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next week.
Resist Bot Live originally airs as a live stream every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, and is brought to you by the same folks behind the chatbot. If you haven't used ResistBot before, it's simple. iPhone users, go to resist.bot on the web and tap the iMessage button. Non-iPhone users, open your text messaging app and compose a new text message. For the phone number, type 50409. In the message field, type resist or any of the keywords you heard on the show. You can also direct message ResistBot on Twitter or the Telegram app. For a printable keyword guide and more resources, visit our website at resist.bot. Our website has a complete guide to creating robust public policy or voter turnout campaigns, and we're here to support your activism. Email support at resist.bot if you need help getting started. ResistBot is a non-profit social welfare organization built by volunteers and supported by your donations. You can donate on our website or email volunteer at resist.bot if you want to join our team. ResistBot Live is moderated by Melanie Dion. Our regular panel includes Athena Foulet, Christine Liu, Susan Stutz, and Dr. Joseph Kuhill.